This is Transfiguration Sunday, the 11th of February, 2024. Can you believe Ash Wednesday is Valentine's Day, 14th of February coming up. This is one of my favorite days, one of my favorite passages. This is, by the way, 199 Len Talks that are trying to help you as communicators come to terms with reading the Bible semiotically and reading these, these stories and these letters from a lens, a semiotic lens, hence the Len Talk lens. Today, I'm going to choose the, the, what else can you choose, but the transfiguration story. And um, th this is a, an incredible, an incredible um, moment in Jesus' life. Two high moments of Jesus' life. Two times God the Father speaks to Jesus with his own voice. Baptism, transfiguration. Same words used. This is my beloved son, or you are my beloved son. You bring me great pleasure. But then this time, the transfiguration voice says, add something else. Another codicil. Listen to him. Who do you listen to? Peter, James, and John are told, they're thinking, okay, we got... We got, we're in this incredible moment. Let's build these booths up here. Let's Moses, Elijah, Jesus. No, you listen to my son. Who are you listening to? Listen to him. Jesus is now embodied Torah, embedded temple. This is a new covenant. It's a new day. We're into the future. And to move into the future, who are you listening to? And we are told here in this transfiguration story. By the way, there's so many parallels. We could spend the whole time just doing parallels. Jesus leaves the first bapt his baptism, goes into the desert, be tempted. He goes down the mountain for his transfiguration, and immediately met by demons, and the real world could go on and on. But don't listen to anybody else. Listen now to Jesus. Listen to him. And so I repeat, who are you listening to? Now, as I was growing up, there was a real strong sense that there were people who were bad influences. And there were people in your life that could wrongly influence you. And you don't listen to them. You shouldn't listen to them. There were bad influencers. And um, there was kind of a sense, they didn't call it like this, but I, I like to think of it as the influenza of influence. That you, you were, you caught uh, things if you allowed these bad influencers and you listened to the, to the wrong people. And so I, we were, there was this thing for yourself. Um, don't take it from anybody. You just, you got to think for yourself and, and, um, and take, and these influencers around you can be benign or malign. And you sometimes don't know which is, but where they're, who's benign and who's malign. So, um, be careful. And the only ones that you could really trust were adults, teachers, uh, pastors, doctors. There were this, this select group of benign influencers, good influencers. And the one you couldn't listen to were your peers. Never trusted your peers to influence you. And <laughs> where, look at, where are we today? Law, and this is long before Harold Bloom's um, most well-known book, his 1973, The Anxiety of Influence. I was aware that there were mentors or predecessors who, who would influence me, but at the same time, my whole life would, would kind of struggle against them. There would be a little kickback and, and a little competition. 
And to be who God wanted me to be, there was this sense, and I got this a lot from my mother, Reverend Mabel Bugsweet, that um, I had to, in some ways, transcend these influences, even transcend her. She said, you're going to you're gonna go beyond me. And, and so there was this friction, if you will, this, this built-in um, kind of uh, literary or scholarly equivalent of uh, what in Freudian psychology is the, the Oedipus complex. But even as you're, you know, kicking against these, these influencers in your life, you, you had to always speak well of the bridge that carried you across. You always had to honor your debts. You always had to dance for the one who brought you. And so even to this day, I mean, anybody knows anything about my books? Uh, all of them. You got footnotes because I want to honor those influence who influenced me, even though I'm not quoting them or something, they still influence me. And if I'm talking about something and they influence the way in which I look at something or just brought me into the conversation, I'm footnoting them. I'm they're there. So you know who my conversation partners are. You know who has influenced me. I'm not hiding it. Um, but you don't seek. And this is the other thing here. You don't seek to influence anybody. Influence is like happiness, the byproduct of something else like diligence, hard work, um, obedience, faithfulness, servanthood. If you aspire after influence, your true influence will expire. Don't want to be influencing others, but getting them to think for themselves, getting them to, so you, I, so you argue, you convince, you convict, you, you debate, but you don't override their ability to say, I agree with you, I don't agree with you, you're wrong, um, you're right. Um, and the, the sense that, and this is key here, that in cases of influence, the active partner is not the one who exerts the influence. The active partner is the one on whom the influence is exerted. And so be careful as you're being influenced because you're the active one. Now, that world's gone. Everything I just said, that world's gone. I mean, I find myself in a whole new world now. And since the digital generations have appeared, Peers have supplanted parents and trusted adults as influencers to the point where influencing now is a career. <laughs> it's a it's a it's a goal. It's a profession. Um, you 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 only admit as your influencers peers. You don't admit as your influencers uh, sages and yodas and and um, and trusted adults. And so we have platform influencers. YouTube, Mr. Beast, 101 million subscribers, made $123 million last year just influencing people, doing nothing but being paid to influence people for products, for brands. Um, uh, Mark Plyer has 33 million subscribers on YouTube. TikTok, Charlie D'Amelio. 146 million followers so she can influence them. And then those are platform influencers. Then you have kind of celebrity influencers beyond platforms like Dwayne The Rock Johnson, Selena Gomez, Ariana Grande, Taylor Swift, Kim Kardashian. Um, and they make huge sums of money being paid, whether they just paid to influence. You'll be, if, you'll, if you'll sell my product, um, Kylie Jenner, Instagram, can make over one million per sponsored post. In other words, she endorses a product, she gets a million bucks. She's made about 590 million so far from her influencer career, just influencing people. people. Dwayne Johnson, same thing, Instagram, YouTube, make a million dollars per sponsored post. Annual earnings, well, almost 300 million, just doing nothing but influencing people. Mr. Beast, as I said, 123 million just last year. Um, 
the very top influencers, six or seven figures with brands to promote products per post. No wonder the newest major in colleges is influencing. You want to be an influencer, you get a major in how to be an influencer, how to create your network, how to manage or manipulate um, your, your sponsorships. Um, and we're at a point now for even beyond that, we're at a point where some of the most new influencers are now globally computer generated influencers. First one from South Korea, Oh Rosie, appeared on Instagram in 2020. She's an advertisement now for Tiffany, for Calvin Klein. Um, she shows up on in, in, as guests on TV shows. I mean, this you know this is an avatar. This is a digital creation, but she's an influencer, and people follow her and take. Oh, Rosie, she responds to social media fans with question and answer sessions. Um, and and every company now wants to be represented by a. a, a uh, its own virtual celebrity influencer. And you got virtual pop singers and girl bands like MAVE, M-A-V-E, South Korea's tourism board, just recently replaced as exposed person and ambassador, the captain of the national soccer team <laughs> with Yao Lizzy, an avatar in digital confection. And you got marketing firms, I, I, even classifying different kinds of influencers that they believe shape the future. So you got entrepreneurs, culture crossers, karma queens, middlemen, denim dads, E. Listus, Elitus, Ms. Independent, um, Parentocrats, Geek Gods. And we give many, many examples of, of each one. Now, I, I want to provide a little biblical perspective on what the power of these words from the heavens to Jesus is and to us, listen to him. I, I had a professor, one of my favorite professors, uh, came from a whole different tradition from me, uh, but I loved him dearly. His name was Charles Merritt Nielsen. He was a hardcore Calvinist, a Presbyterian Calvinist, and uh, came from Sacramento, California. Um, I, he was my historical theologian mentor and uh he he loved historical theology he wrote articles on clement of rome he wrote articles on on uh, papius um he was also one of the great satirists and humorous and one of my favorite pieces and one day this will be discovered and people will celebrate this as in some ways maybe the high pinnacle of theological humor. He wrote a sarcastic, satirical piece for our perspectives in religious studies. I think they're the only ones that would take it, called Communion for Dogs. It, it's, it's one of the great masterpieces of, it's like you're reading Jonathan Swift. Uh, I mean, he was brilliant. But he had a, depending on what kind of a week he was having with us, um, and he called, you know, he, he, he had one incredible sense of humor. He had a little list problem, which made his humor even better. But he, he would say, okay, class, today, just saying 80% of my theology is right, 20% is wrong. I just don't know which is which. Now, that's a good week. A bad week, he'd go, oh, it's a bad week. 70% of my theology is right, 20, 30% is wrong. I just don't know which is which. And his point was that nobody gets it all right. And if I go to heaven and die, and theologically, even though he's a hardcore Calvinist, he, he, he's, he, he, he professes this with all his might, soul, and strength, still, he, he is admitting for up front, the beginning of class, I see through a glass dimly. I boast no immaculate perceptions. Um, oh, he's an academic, so he is cleaning off that glass as best he can with his Windex. But we only, as hard as we try, only know in part, as one day we will know even as we are known. But until that time, he's admitting from the very beginning that he could be wrong. 
And so I continue with my students. I passed on his tradition. And I just, I begin it with, a little differently than he did, I just say, don't take it from me. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to Len Sweet. If I say something, and if and when I say it, you are already in your spirit saying, you know, he's right about that. I never thought of it that way. Or I've never had words for it until now, but that is exactly what I've been thinking and feeling. If what I am saying is not being convicted and convinced in you, then don't take it from me because that could be my 20% or that's a good week, a bad week, 30%. I mean, I could be wrong about that. Um, but wait a minute. That could also be your 20% of your 30%. That's why we've got to be in conversation. That's why we have to listen to one another. As at the same time, okay, the only one you should take it from is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that's in your, your spirit, confirming, convicting, convincing you that what I am saying is true. And so if that's happening, then, wait a minute, then we're now in a period of accountability because you're not taking a movie, you're taking from the Holy Spirit. And now you're accountable and I'm accountable. And we have confirmation with one another. But if you're not, if when you listen to me, you aren't hearing the Holy Spirit speak, and convict you and convince you and and say that's true then then we need to be in conversation because it could be my 20 30 percent your 20 30 percent or some weeks maybe 50 percent i mean the holy spirit only take it from the holy spirit only take it only listen to jesus and what is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. And this is the power of that word paraclete. When Jesus says, I'm going to send you the paraclete, we translate the word the comforter. And it's no, it's such a bad translation because it, when immediately you hear comforter, we hear a blanket. And so this may, it makes you warm and cuddly. No, no, no. The comforter, when some translations are advocate. Um, but literally, para means alongside. Kaline, where we get kalitos, means to, to, to call. And so it means somebody who is summoned to walk beside you, alongside you, para, beside you, but at the same time give you counsel and, and, and guidance and, and encouragement. So... Jesus says the paraclete will come and make known to you really what you should listen to. Should make known to you um, my voice, my wisdom, my encouragement. The shaping influence of your life should be the paraclete. And I call the best translation for the paraclete for me is Godfluence. The only one you should listen to are the God influencer, which is the Holy Spirit. Someone who guides, gives wisdom and voice and shaping influence to your life. And this is what the paraclete is, summoned to aid you, to guide you, to be walk beside you, stand along with you, guide you towards good and towards God, and in the light of the gospel. So, I repeat what God said at the transfiguration to all of us, to Peter, James, John, Len, and you. Listen to him. Don't learn from each other. Hear each other out, but listen to him. Don't take it from me. Don't take it from an influencer. Only take it from the Holy Spirit. The only one you can trust. 
to, to be the God influencer for your life. Take it from him. Take it from Jesus. Take it from the paraclete. The God-fluencer.